couple days ago, I asked you guys what you want to see next, and the overwhelming majority of you said back end for front end devs. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Today, I'm going to be giving you a high level overview of what back end sort of looks like. This is not exhaustive, and this is also not a to do app type thing. We're not going to be implementing anything. Instead, I want to show you the sort of high level mental model that I have for back end and hopefully give you an idea of how all this works so that if you then do want to go and implement a to do app and follow a tutorial, you have you have a more you have a better idea of what's actually happening instead of just you know mindlessly copying code the best place to start in my opinion is going to be with a standard standalone backend api server so let's establish a couple things first first of all the way i like to think about backend and the way servers work is they are effectively little computers in the cloud that you can orchestrate and manage and run and put whatever you want on those computers so in this example, I have two little boxes in here. I have my Golang Fiber app. This could be whatever you want. This could be an Express app, Fastify app, uh, .NET app, whatever you want it to be. Does not matter. I have an app right here. And then over here, I have a database. Each one of these is going to be its own compute instance out in the cloud. There are a million different ways you can do that. I'll talk about that later. But for now, just imagine these as little computers in the cloud that are running all the time that can talk to each other. So our Golang Fiber app will start in here. This is whenever you're doing front end development, you're probably going to be making API calls. Obviously, you're going to be going to some API slash some route, you're going to be posting some data or getting some data that is going to be handled by this fiber app or whatever HTTP server you have. And within here, we're going to have a couple different things. So this is a high level abstraction. This is not how all of them work. And this isn't even technically accurate to everything, but it's a mental model that will give you a sort of idea of how this works. So when you have an API, that API is going to have a gateway. That gateway is going to be listening on some port at some URL. Whenever you make a request to the URL, we're not going to get into the specifics of how exactly that works, but that's going to go through this gateway that'll involve, you know, like the reverse proxy, the, um, reverse proxy listener all that stuff and that will go through this gateway and then this gateway will send that request to whichever handler it belongs to in this example we have a get handler at the root a post handler at slash and then a 404 which is just the catch-all of if it doesn't match one of these two it'll go here so when I make a request to the root path, so if I just did api.mycompany.com slash, I made a get request there, it's gonna hit this gateway, the gateway will do something, then it'll go to this get request. And then on this get request, this is what we're actually implementing. So whenever you're using a framework like Fiber, like Express, like Fastify, like any of these different things, they're gonna handle basically all of this for you. What you're actually gonna be doing in code, is you're gonna be implementing these different handlers. You're gonna be implementing this get request, this post request. Uh, you can implement a custom 404 if you want, but usually I mean, well, you should, but I'm irresponsible and lazy, so I usually don't, but it's neither here nor there. So you're implementing these handlers so that when we make this request, the gateway sends it to this get request, it will do something, and then it will send back this, it'll send back the body of test high or whatever, whatever you want it to be. And if you've done any front end work with a back end API, I'm sure you're very familiar with the pattern of making a request and then waiting for the response. And generally speaking, this isn't always the case, but I like to think about back end as pretty much always following this pattern. You're going to be making requests to different places within the backend and then getting responses from them. And that even translates to the database. So over here, I have this Postgres instance. These are gonna be hosted separately on their own compute instances. Theoretically, you could put them on the same box, but for this example, we're gonna separate them because typically that's how it's done in tutorials. And as you're learning, it's more of an advanced use case to put them all on one disk so or on one machine or instance or whatever. So for this example, we have a Postgres database over here and we need to talk to that from this get request. So this server will then use the SQL query language to communicate with this Postgres database. You'll send over a query that's like select info from test or whatever. Then after you've selected that info, that will be sent back over via, um, that will be sent back over to this get request, which will then handle and process all that data. And then it'll send it back down to whoever requested through the, requested it through the gateway. And that's sort of how all this stuff works. What you're really doing within backend is you're gonna be implementing all these different handlers. And there's a ton of different stuff you can do here there's stuff like headers there's queries there there's bodies there's all this different stuff but you can get into that in another in other videos but really for this i just want to show you that this is what you're really doing you're implementing these little handlers real quick if you guys are enjoying this video make sure you guys like subscribe do all that stuff if you want to support me more and you're interested in finance stuff you can go ahead and join the discord for my company insider viz we just started that up trying to get all that set up and running feedback and that kind of thing and also we're just putting out a survey now to try and better gauge what you guys want to see on that so if you're interested in finance at all please do consider taking that quick survey it's 
two minute survey. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the video. APIs are not the only thing that you're going to be working with in backend development. Databases are another really important concept that you should that you should know if you want to get into backend development. So at a high level, there are two main categories that you're going to be working with. The first is going to be SQL and the other is going to be NoSQL. So a SQL database is going to be using the SQL query language and it's going to be generally speaking a relational database. So that means that all of your different tables can be related to each other using primary keys and foreign keys and all of these relations are built in in a huge part of the language itself and are a huge part of the database itself. Then NoSQL is basically just JSON. It's that's a very that's a bit of a reductive way to put it. There's a lot more to it than that. But generally speaking, you can just think of these as JSON documents that get put into collections and there's no schema. There's no enforced setup. You can kind of just put whatever you want, wherever you want. It's really quick and easy to work with versus SQL is more structured and ordered and has to have a dedicated schema and all this stuff. So right here to illustrate this, I put together this really basic example of a data model that is going to have a user's collection that is going to have a user's table slash collection and then an interests um, table. So what this is going to do is it's just going to have all of our different users which need to be mapped to interests. So imagine we have some app that is going to be like a social media app. We have our users and then those users are going to have interests and we don't know how many interests they're going to have. So we need to create some way of keeping track of those interests and relating them to our users. So in the SQL world, what we can do is we can use what's called a relationship. And in this case, the relationship is going to be a one to many relationship where we have a foreign key on the actual or we have a foreign key on the interest table so here all our users table is going to have some id and then this interest table over here is going to have a foreign key that's like user id or whatever and that's going to point over to this table so that means that these two are related together so our users and our interests are stored in a separate place but they're related together using the sql setup and how all that stuff works versus over here no sql if you remember earlier i said this is basically just json and that holds true here we have our users collection and that's all we have i don't have a separate interest collection because what I do is I just nest so I just nest an array within my JSON. So I just go ahead and I say, okay, my name is going to be test. Then my interests are going to be, then my interests are just going to be an array of strings. So I just have swimming and then you could add more if you wanted to. And same thing here, we could just make another interest document and go from there. These have their pros and cons. Their you know, different use cases are going to have different, um, different use cases are going to be better for different things. I have some videos on that. And I'm going to make more videos on that in the future. But generally speaking, these are the two categories as you're learning. Um, I would definitely start with SQL, start there. And then if you have a, if you have, if you can justify to yourself the reason why you should use no SQL, do it. Otherwise, stick with SQL. Final thing I think is worth talking about in this brief little introduction is going to be a servered versus serverless approach to your servers. At this point, I think that these are such important concepts that you need to understand how these works. So the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be a servered architecture. This is at the beginning of the video when I said, when we host these, we are basically just putting computers out in the cloud that are going to be running all the time, can do whatever we want. Here we have a fiber app that's just running out in the cloud. Uh, when you host that, you would host that to like an AWS EC2 instance or to like a railway app or something. You're just uploading your code to some uh you're uploading your code to some computer out in California that's going to be running all the time and will be sending and will be serving and handling all those requests. And that's going to be the servered approach. You're just renting a computer for a fixed fee. It's usually hourly or minutely or secondly, however they want to do it. They'll just pay you some fee to use it based on the hardware you're using. Then you get access to that and you can do whatever you want with it. It's really nice. But the other way you can do this is what's called a serverless approach. And the serverless approach was popularized by the AWS Lambda technology and has sort of dominated and taken over the space for the last couple of years and the way serverless works what that actually is is serverless is a way of hosting that means that whenever you make a request to your server it will be created it will execute that request and then it will die and that's very different from a server so remember in our server example this is existing in perpetuity this doesn't actually uh, in the mental model, this does not exist in perpetuity. This ceases to exist when there's no requests or traffic. So that means that you're not being billed if, say, you have a restaurant app that is only going to be active from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. when people are looking up your restaurant. No one's searching for it at 2 a.m. So you can just let your server sleep. The server will be sleeping. And instead of when you had a traditional server, you'd be paying for that. But the serverless, you don't pay for it. It's great. So the way that works is since it's down most of the time, whenever you have a request come in, so whenever someone makes a GET request to my server, it's going to fire some server and it's going to light this up and actually turn it on and execute that request, send down the response and then die. And that's how serverless works. It's basically just paying for what exactly what you use and nothing more. You're not renting a server. You're just renting a serverless 
like rental type thing or whatever. I don't really know what to call it. And this has some pros and cons. Um, a, one big thing that's really important to note is that if you need to save state within this server, you can't do that because remember, this will spin up and down every single time. So if I needed to keep track of, for some reason on my server, I wanted to keep track of a counter of every time someone made a get request here, increment a counter by one. This is a terrible example and you should never do something like this in real life. If you do need to keep track of like logging or something, use a logging service or save it to a database. Don't write anything to the disk on your server. That's not a good idea. But for this example, let's say we're trying to do that. That would not work because we are on a serverless architecture because if we spin it up, we would increment that counter by one, but then that instance will get destroyed. So when that instance gets destroyed, well, it's gone. So then your next, uh, the next time someone makes a request is going to increment that counter back up to one, but then it'll get destroyed again. So it just keeps going and going and it'll never work versus if we had a server instance, you would just have it set to one, then two, then three, then four, and it will be persist in perpetuity or as long as you're paying for that instance. So that's a little overview of how those work. A really important thing to note is that if you're doing backend development in Next.js and hosting it to Vercel, that is always going to be serverless. So you need to remember that when you're developing your backend that it's a serverless architecture and there's some concerns that come with that, but that's sort of how that works. And <clears throat> but that's sort of how that works. So hopefully that gives you a very brief introduction to backend. Like I said, this is not a code breakdown. If you want to see a code breakdown, I have some of that. And there are a billion other people who have stuff like that. That's not the point of this. The point is I want to show you this sort of high level overview in these diagrams. If you want to see this for other stuff like background jobs, like uh, caching, queues, Redis, maybe a logging system, microservices, all that kind of thing. If you want to see that and you'd be inter interested there, please let me know. I will make sure to get to those when I can. And with all of that out of the way, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.